And everybody said, yeah. Father, we thank you at this time. We bless your name because of what you are doing already. Thank you for all these churches we're looking at. And thank you, Lord, because you want to perfect your church. We're praying, oh Lord, every form of imperfection you take away from every life in Jesus' name. What you are looking for, what you want to see, what will gladden your heart, what will give you pleasure in the church. We pray that you affect it and impact it to our lives in Jesus' name. We're asking, Lord, that this church that you are building will stand firm on the foundation. And that we pray that this church will be pleasing unto you in Jesus' name. We pray that every member, every worker, every leader, every pastor, every shepherd, every overseer, everyone that is doing anything in the kingdom of God, Lord, will be so far away from the world and so intimate with the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything you want to accomplish in our lives, you accomplish in Jesus' name. Keep us awake again this morning as we look at the next church. I will pray that all the beauty of holiness that we see here, you put and implant in every life in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Once again, we come to Revelation. We are now in Revelation chapter 3. We have been looking at the churches as Christ himself looks at the church. It's building the church. It says upon this rock, I will build my church. It's his church. It's not a church. It's not mine. You don't have ownership of the church. I don't have ownership of the church. Christ has ownership of the church. And it says, I build my church. And it's the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church's building. And we pray that this will be part of his church and the gates of hell shall not prevail in Jesus' name. Uh, John the Beloved had been kind of banished into the Isle of Patmos. But it was in that place of persecution that the Lord began to reveal to him the state of the churches in Asia Minor. And he chose seven of them and the seven were to represent the whole church at that time and the whole church of the church age until Christ will come. He is speaking to the church in Ephesus and the church in Smyrna and the church in Pagamos and the church in Tatira and the church in Sardis and the church in Philadelphia and the church in Laodicea. With those seven churches, he sends message to the whole church. And at the end of every message, he says, He that has ear to hear, and ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying, not just to that church, but saying to all the churches. And we'll be looking at the churches one by one. We started with number one, a fundamental church in a pluralistic world. Number two, a fearless church in a persecuting world. Number three, a flattering church in a faltering church in a perverted world. Number four, a feeble church in a putrefying world. Number five, a formal church in a perishing world. We come to number six this morning, a faithful church in a, pessim in a pessimistic world. Number seven, we'll look at that later as the Lord gives us the strength. A flattered church in a permissive world. They will bring the conclusion to the series of messages for the churches overcomers in the promised eternal world. We we'll look at this uh, this morning, a faithful church in a pessimistic world. We're looking at Revelation chapter 3 and I'm reading from verse 7. Revelation chapter 3, looking at verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, This thing says he that is holy, he that is true, and he that has the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before, before thy feet, 
and to know that I have loved thee, because thou hast, hast kept the word of my patience. I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is in New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. That's the church we're looking at uh, this morning. And praise the Lord, this church has no condemnation at all. In some of the other churches, the Lord will say, this is good, that is right, and that is, uh, that is uh, beneficial. But I have somewhat against you. Or nevertheless, I have somewhat against you. But in this case, nothing against this church. There are some people that tell us that you cannot be so holy that God will not find something against you. But the all searching eyes of the Lord Jesus Christ finds nothing to be reproved, nothing to be corrected, nothing about this church, only to hold fast until the very end. And I pray that this same picture will be repeated in every one of our lives and in our church in Jesus' name. As we look at this church, once again, we're looking at uh, the first line there, and to the angel of the church, if I didn't feel right, it's writing to the church, but it's writing to the angel of that church. The angel of that church was the leader. It was uh, the pastor there, the overseer there, the, 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 the shepherd there, leading that floor. But he calls him an angel. Why? We've been showing the reason from church to church why the Lord Jesus Christ addressed those leaders and those pastors, those overseers, and those shepherds, why he addressed them as angels. And we've been making the application to you and to ourselves that if you are a leader in that house fellowship, if you are a pastor in that uh, district, if you are an overseer in that region, you're an overseer in that state, an overseer in that, in that nation, and you have charge of some members of the flock of God. You are the angel there. But why? Why are you referred to as an angel? We're looking at the first Kings chapter 19. First Kings chapter 19. Angels add responsibility. And you have responsibility too. And because of the similarity of the responsibilities that the angels have and that you have, that's why you're referred to in that congregation as the angel of that church. In First Kings chapter 19, I'm reading from verse 5. First Kings 5. And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. This is the story of Elijah. He was discouraged because uh, that woman Jezebel, the wife of Ahab, had threatened but that by this time tomorrow that her gods will punish her if, if it, she didn't do something negative, something cruel, something devastating, something murderous against this Elijah. And because of that, Elijah ran away, ran for his life. But now an angel was sent to him to feed him. Isn't that a ministry that we're saying to those who are discouraged? We're saying to those who are downcast? We're saying to those who are backslidden? We're, we're saying to those who feel that they cannot go further anymore to minister to them, to feed them, to encourage them, and to lighten their body. And because of that responsibility that we have towards the church, just like the angels had towards the people when God sent them to the people. That's why you are called the angel of that local church, the angel of that state church, the angel of that regional church, or the angel of that national church. Here we find the angel coming and saying, Arise and eat. And he looked and behold, and there was a cake baked on the coals, and a, co a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink and laid him down again. 
Sometimes as we minister to the people who are discouraged and the people who are downcast, just one message will not do. And just one touch will not do. And just one motivation or encouragement will not do. We have to do that again. That's what the angel had to do again. Look at verse 7. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. Sometimes we have to tell the brethren how heavy the load is, how uphill task they're going to perform. And we have to tell them that the journey is too long for thee. We show the people they need the grace of God, the strength of God, the unction of God, the anointing of God. And they need the backing of the Lord before they can go through the journey. That's what the angel was doing to Elijah. He told him, there's a journey before you. And you know that this was the final journey, the last journey before actually he went to the place, was raptured to heaven. We're preparing the people of God for the rapture. And that's why we're told that we are the angels of the church were present. And then in verse 8, and he arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that, of that meat 40 days and 40 nights unto Horeb, the mount of God. And so you understand, we are the angels of the churches we represent. Now we're looking at the church. What does the church become? As we minister to the church, as we encourage the church, as we instruct the church, as we study the Bible, the Word of God, what well, the church has given the manna of heaven, the bread of life, unto the church. The church becomes strong. Those who are not saved become saved. Those who are not sanctified become sanctified. Those who are kind of wavering and unstable become stable and steadfast. And those who appear that, you know, their strength is, is failing them, they become so stable. And those who appear that they want to stop their journey halfway, they're able to rise up again and move on in their journey. And I pray that that kind of ministry that will strengthen the church, establish the church, sanctify the church, the Lord will give to every one of us in Jesus' name. That whatever your area of ministry, there are some Elijahs there who are discouraged, some Moses there who are discouraged, and they feel they cannot go on. You are the angel of the church. You are finding out. You come to them at the right time, and you encourage them to get up and take the bread of life and take the scriptures and the promises of God, and then it destroys of that that you minister to them, they are able to move on. The church will move on in Jesus' name. Now the church, we're looking at Acts of the Apostles chapter 2 verse 47. Acts chapter 2 verse 47. Praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. What's the church? The church is an assembly, a fellowship, a company, a congregation of saved people, saved people, saved people. They come in and they are saved, and after they get saved, then their lives turn around. If any man be in Christ, it's a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things have become new. And then as you teach them more, they become holy, they become righteous, they become godly, they are sanctified. Then you teach them more, then they are filled with the Holy Ghost to teach them more. And the gifts of the Spirit for the work He has given us to do is imparted into their lives. So teach them more, they become knowledgeable in the Word of God, in the will of God. They are fed with knowledge and with understanding. And that makes them so solid that they become part of the church that the devil cannot overcome. I pray the Lord will do that for our church. Acts chapter 9, verse 31, the church. Acts chapter 9, verse 31. It says in verse 31, Then at the church's rest throughout all Judea and Galilee. The church had rest throughout Galilee, Judea, Galilee, and Samaria, and were edified, walking in the fear of the Lord. That's the church, walking in the fear of the Lord. They don't become lawless, but now they are law abiding. They, now they are loyal. Now they are faithful. And it says they are walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost. They were multiplied. As we look at this, we're looking at the church that is faithful in a pessimistic world. In a pessimistic world. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. Pessimistic world. What does that mean, pessimistic? They look at us, they say, what can this babbler say? What will this barbarian do? 
What will this unintelligent person, what will he do? What will this fellow, what will he amount to? And that's what they think, but don't worry about that. That's, that was the attitude to the Lord Jesus Christ, John chapter 1. The world in which we minister, the world in which we, we have to get people out of that place and bring them into the kingdom of God. When you look at us, they are pessimistic. They don't think we have anything, and yet we have what will help them to get to the kingdom of God. In John chapter 1, I'm reading there from verse 10. It says, he was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. The Pharisees looked at the Lord Jesus Christ. They were pessimistic about his person, and about the program he came for. And about the sacrifice he was going to make for the salvation of the world. The world was made by him. But the world knew him not. He came unto his own. And his own received him not. A pessimistic. They didn't want him. They had religion. No regeneration, but they thought religion was enough. And they had their services. They thought that was enough. No salvation. And they had all their rituals, even though there was no righteousness, they thought that was enough. Therefore, it says, he came unto his own, and he soon received him not. But thank God there are people that received him. Thank God there are people that are receiving today in verse 12. But as many as received him to them, he gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. We're looking at first John, first John chapter three. The world knew him not. How about us today? Look at first John chapter three, verse one. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not. Pessimistic. The world knoweth us not. The world does not reckon with us. We are the people that the Heavenly Father has sent. We are the people that Jesus Christ has sent. We are the people filled and saturated with the Holy Ghost. And we are saying to the world to bring this gospel and this word of life unto the people of the world. And yet it says, the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. And yet, we're going to take the message to the world. And the world, many of them, they're going to be converted in Jesus' name. Look at chapter 3 of Revelation. I just read chapter 3 to you now. And you will see that this was a very wonderful church. What a church. Number one, there, there was no condemnation. No condemnation. Why was there no condemnation? Number two, because there was no corruption. There was no corruption. You can't find any corruption in this particular church. A church can be righteous. A church can be so saved. A church can be so sanctified. A church can be so purified. A church can be so purged that there will be no condemnation and there will be no corruption. It will happen in this church. I say it will happen in this church. Number three, there was no conformity to the world. No conformity to the world. This church was cleansed. This church was converted. And this church was so pure. There was no conformity at all to the world. All the principles of the world, the perversions of the world, the pollutions of the world, all the practices of the world, they had no place in this particular church. And I pray all those things of the world will not have we will not have any place in this church in Jesus' name. Number four, number four, there was no compromise in worship. No compromise in worship. You think about a church that they looked at their, they looked Jesus Christ, looked at their worship, at their style, everything they did, from the little to the, from the smallest to the greatest, and there was no compromise at all in their worship. Number five, there was no conflict among the worshippers. No conflict among the worshippers. You'll find in the case, you know, in, for the Corinth, in the, among the Corinthians, much conflict. You'll find in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 6, there was a complaint and murmuring. But in this case, there was no conflict at all among the worshippers. Number 6, there was no cowardice in warfare. No cowardice in warfare. 
The warfare was there. Satan was battling against the church as he battles against every church. Because Satan opposes everything that Christ does. But in this place, there's no cowardice at all. There was courage. Courage in warfare. And that same courage, the Lord will implant in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. And then number seven, there was no contradiction of his will. No contradiction of his will. Whatever the Lord said, that's what he did. Whatever the Lord demanded, that is what he gave to the Lord. There was no contradiction at all. There was nobody saying, I'll go my way, I'll do my sin. As if there were no king and there was no Lord in the church. And there was no leadership in the church. But in this church, no contradiction of his will. No condemnation. No corruption, no corruption of the world, no conformity to the world, no compromise in worship, and no conflict among the worshippers, and no cowardice in warfare, only courage in warfare, and no contradiction of his will. Let's look at the church now. We're going to divide this into three parts. Number one, Christ's perfection, power, and characteristics introduces himself and we see Christ's perfection we see Christ's power we see Christ's characteristics number two the Christian's purity perseverance and consecration the Christian's purity perseverance and consecration then number three the concourse position as a pillar and his crown the concourse position a pillar, and then we look at his crown. Number one, Christ's perfection, power, and characteristics. We're looking at it. Revelation chapter 3, verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write, The thing says, He that is holy, he that is true, and he that has the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, he that shutteth and no man openeth. Here the Lord Jesus Christ introduced himself. He introduced himself to this church. And the Lord first introduced himself to the church, his church, as the one that is holy. Have you noticed that concerning the Lord Jesus Christ was holy through and through? He was holy in his conception. The angel said, that holy thing that shall be born of you. Even before he came to this world, he had been holy. The holiness was there. Eternal holiness. Everlasting holiness. Holiness within, holiness without. Holiness through and through. The sin, the holy thing that shall be born of thee. And then he came to this world and he lived a holy life. He said, which of you convinced me of sin? And then eventually, even when he died, that centurion said, this man was a holy man of God, the son of God. And then they, all, the, all, all the demons on this, in the Sunday ministry, any time he confronted them, they said, what have we to do with you? The holy one of God, he was holy through and through. And so it says, he who is holy, not only that, he who is true, truth personified. We're told that the Lord came through Moses, but truth and grace came to the, through the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the only source of our holiness and is the only true way unto God. Christ is the Holy One. Angels and demons called him the Holy One. Men and enemies knew him to be the Holy One, and they found no fault in him. His sacrifice and atonement for our sins was acceptable to God because he was holy, because he was righteous, because he was spotless, and because he was sinless, pure, and perfect. And he, he, and he has divine power, he has divine authority to demand holiness and to make us holy. Now the difference between the holiness of the Lord Jesus and the holiness of people like Enoch, like Moses, like Joshua, like Isaiah, like any of the other people in the Bible is they had the holiness. They couldn't pass on the holiness to other people. But in the case of the Lord Jesus Christ, he has the holiness and he has the ability and the strength and the authority to make us holy. He can pass it on. I pray that his holiness will be passed on to you in Jesus' name. 
the power to cleanse, he has that. And the power to purify, he has that. And the power to make us holy, he has that. Once you come to the Lord, that holiness of the Lord Jesus will come not just on you outwardly, outward holiness, but there will be the inward holiness and he will do it for us in Jesus' name. Then we are told that Christ is the one that is true. The characteristic is often referred to in the New Testament as he being true. I've already told you that he is full of grace and truth. Truth came by the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. His testimony is to this end, for this purpose was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. He is the truth that sets us free from all sin. Let's look at the Word of God and see the affirmation of all this. We're looking at, we're looking at Acts of the Apostles chapter 3. Acts of the Apostles chapter 3, and I'm reading from verse 14 and from verse 15. Acts of the Apostles chapter 3, we're looking at verse 14. It says, but she denied the Holy One and the just. Here Peter was talking to the, to the people of Israel. He said, you denied the Holy One, he that is holy, and you denied the just, and desired a murderer to be granted unto you. And you killed the Prince of Life, whom God has raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. He is holy. And I pray that he'll make you holy. In Hebrews chapter 7, Hebrews chapter 7, we see his perfection. We see his purity. We see his characteristics. Hebrews chapter 7, reading from verse 25 and verse 26. Verse 25 and verse 26, chapter 7 of Hebrews. It tells us, wherefore he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. He is holy and therefore nothing hinders his prayer. He is holy and nothing hinders his intercession because he ever liveth to make intercession for us. For such an high priest became us. Such an high priest is sufficient for us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. We see there that, you know, every part of Scripture confirms that he is holy. He is a lamb without blemish. The lamb that is holy, that is pure. Revelation tells us in chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19, looking at this character of Christ, characteristic of Christ, that he is true as well as holy. Revelation chapter 19 from verse 11. And I saw the head, I saw heaven who opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he does judge and make war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself in verse 13 and he was closed with a vesture deep in blood he sacrificed and shed his blood for us and his name is called the word of god we come to john what we'll be referring to is fullness of truth we'll come to john chapter 1 john chapter 1 reading from verse 14 john chapter 1 verse 14 and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. It's referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. Why don't you back up to verse 1? In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. There's the Word personified. The same was in the beginning with God. And all things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. Now verse 14, and the Word, referring to Christ, you see it's capital W there, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace, and what's the next word there? Truth. It's full of grace and full of truth. John chapter 14, a verse well known, a verse we need to trust and depend on so much 
John chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Christ is the way, is the truth, and the life. Listen to what follows. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. No man, no matter how morally sound, cometh unto the Father but by me. No man, no matter how noble, cometh to the Father but by me. No man, no matter how religious, no man cometh to the Father but by me. No man, no matter how philanthropic, generous, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. He is the only way of salvation. He is the only path to the Father. He is the only bridge by which we can cross from our sinfulness and cause, cross over to his righteousness. He is the way. He is the truth. And he is the life. No one can come to the Father except by him. As we come to Revelation again in chapter 1 verse 18, we see this characteristic of Jesus Christ pointed out very clearly. In Revelation chapter 1 verse 18, it says, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and death. He has the keys of death and hell. Isn't that what he said? Look at that once again in chapter 3 verse 7. Revelation chapter 3 verse 7, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, this saying says, he that is holy, that's Christ, and he that is true, that's Christ, and he that has the key of David. He has the key of David. What does that mean? It means that you can, you can use that key to open, and you can use that key to shut, to shut the door. He says, I am the door. If any man comes in, he'll find life, he'll find salvation, he'll find abundant life, eternal life. And, and he having the key of David, that, that is uh, coming from, uh, that's coming from uh, Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 22, Isaiah chapter 22. Isaiah prophesied about Christ so very much, and he talks about him having the key, the key of David. Isaiah chapter 22, reading from verse, reading from verse 22. It says in verse 22 of Isaiah 22, And the key of the house of David when I lay upon his shoulder, so he shall open and none shall shut. Amen. And he shall shut and none shall open. He opens the way of salvation to those who repent, those who believe on him. And when he opens that way of salvation to those who repent, no man However religious, no man, however powerful, can shut the door he opens. Then he shuts the door of salvation to those who refuse to repent. And when he shuts the door to salvation, no man can open that door. He opens the door of opportunity for those who are his servants. And when he opens that door, there is no man that can shut that door. And when he closes a door of opportunity, no man can, uh, can open the door that he shuts. That's the reason why you want to trust him. You want to trust and believe in him because he is the only one that opens and no one can shut and shuts and no man can open. Christ also has a key of final authority. The key of final authority, he who has the key to a house has unlimited access to that house. He who had the key to the palace had regal authority in that house. And this is applied unto Christ, that he has the absolute control in his kingdom in regard to the admission or exclusion of anyone. And when he opens any door of opportunity, no one not even Satan can shut that door. And when he shuts the door to evil and to adversity, no one can open that door. And I pray that as you put your faith and confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ, the door that he has prepared and apportioned for you, he will open it and nobody will shut that door in Jesus' name. 
we'll come to point number two the christian's purity perseverance and consecration i'm reading from chapter three of revelation verse eight verse nine and verse ten here we see this church the church of uh, the of philadelphia and you see the commendation that jesus had for this church you see the promise that he made to this church and again we want to remember we want to remind ourselves no condemnation no compromise and there is no conflict and there is no conformity to the world and there, there is there is no cowardice there's no conflict among them at all and no contradiction to the will of god that everything here in this church was positive look at this reading from verse 8 i know thy works i know thy works that's what he has told every church i know by observation I know by observation, I am there. I know by supervision, I'm walking about in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I observe, I supervise. I know by delegation, I know what I gave you to do. And I know that you're doing it. Will God look at your life? Will Christ look at your life and say, I know. I know by observation. I know that everything is all right. Everything is good. Everything is righteous. Everything is holy. Everything is according to the word of God. There's no contradiction between your life and the word of God. Your thoughts, your disposition, your character, your behavior, your everything about you. Jesus says, I know. I observe. He says, I know because I'm supervising you. There is, a, there is a silent personality that listens to all your conversation, that looks at all your thoughts, that looks at all your heart, and he looks at everything that you do. I know by supervision, I know by delegation, I put you there. And where I put you, are you fulfilling your role there? Because I know, I know. And when you are conscious that God knows and Christ knows, everywhere you go, everything you do, everything you think, all the actions, and everything that you do you want to be very careful and say oh lord help me so that every stage of my life every step of my life i will do everything to please you will please the lord in jesus name but say it i know thy works in the plural it's not just you know the singular we have a lot of works that we do in a secular area i know your secular work in our spiritual area i know your spiritual works in the social realm i know your social activities in the society i know your society interaction i know everything he looks at everything in the day in the night he looks at everything in the busy period and vacation period he looks at everything in the family and outside the family he looks at every responsibility social and secular and spiritual and society he says i know thy works and do you know that god is going to bring everything to remembrance eventually the things that are rewardable and the things that are reprovable to you. I know thy works. Behold, I have said before thee an open door. Now, because of what he knew about this church, that they can take on more activity. They can take on a more profitable ministry. It says, because of that, I open, I set an open door before you. And it says, and no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength. Thou hast a little strength. Little is mighty when God is in it. Little is much when God is in it. When the power of the Lord moves us and motivates us, the little strength we have will accomplish very much. Don't you remember? It says a little, a little faith, a small faith, and a grain of mustard seed can move a mountain, can accomplish much in the kingdom of God. So you cannot say it's because my, my strength is small, because my faith is small, because my grace is small, anything I have is small. But it says little can accomplish much when God is behind. Behind that little sin, it says, because thou hast a little strength and hast catch my word. We can keep his word, we can obey his word, we can be faithful to his word. Once you are not you are not a kind of uh, riveted to any man or woman, and you know that you are looking unto Jesus and only Jesus alone, your mind is with Christ, your spirit with Christ, your attention with Christ, your focus is on Christ, and your aspiration is to please Him, your ambition is to please Him. With that little strength, with that little grace, with that little faith, you can accomplish much and do the work of God and obey the word of God, and has not denied my name. We will not deny his name. I said we will not deny his name. 
whatever challenges come, you know, it, challenges do not come all of a sudden, all together. They come piecemeal. A little challenge today, you have strength to overcome that. A little challenge tomorrow, you have a you have opportunity to overcome that. It comes little by little by little. In your home, a little challenge. In your place of work, a little challenge. In the church, a little challenge. Today, a little challenge. Tomorrow, a little challenge. Everything does not come all of a sudden, all together. And because they come little by little, one at a time, and day after day, the grace to overcome, the Lord will grant everyone in Jesus' name. He says in verse 9, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan. There were again. There are people that think that, well, because my family is so called chick. They are always seeking deliverance day after day because our village is occultic. They are always seeking deliverance every day. And because, you know, the community in which I live, uh, they are occultic there. The environment in which I live, they are occultic there. It says over here, there's a synagogue of Satan. There are people that make so much. They make a mountain of out of him out of out of a hill, and they say so and so said so and so looked at me like this, and I saw so and so in a dream, and because of that, that's why I am weak. No, that's not why you are weak. Because of your unbelief, that's why you are weak. And because they're doing something against me, I saw them in the dream. That's why I'm not able to actually live a victorious Christian life. No, that's not why. It's because you are prayerless. It's not because of them. Because Christ says, I open the door before you. And no man can shut that door in Jesus' name. They say, I have all these enemies around me. How can I succeed? With all those enemies, you will succeed in Jesus' name. Because he opens the door and nobody can shut that door. And when he shuts the door against those demonic powers of the synagogue of Satan, when he shuts that door, they cannot get to you anymore because he says they will not be able, able to open the door he shuts in Jesus' name. Behold, I will make them. I will make them. I will make them. Keep on walking. I will do the rest. Keep on obeying me and I will do the rest. Keep on. Give yourself to what I've committed to your hand. And then I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews. These are religious or cultic people. They say they are Jews and are not. They are not the real Jews. They are not the, they are not the real children of Abraham by faith. Yes, they belong to Abraham by the flesh, but they are cultic. They are the synagogue of Satan. He said they are lying. When they say they are of Abraham, behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet. They will bow. I said they will bow. They will submit in Jesus' name. Uh, have you found that, you know, there are some churches that almost uh, every month and almost every weekend, they are having something, a deliverance uh, event, a deliverance this, a deliverance that. And there are people, they are ignorant. I hope you are not ignorant. I said, I hope you are not ignorant. Uh, they, they are going there every time and they come this month now it's deliverance another time it's deliverance another time it's deliverance how is that how is it like that we don't find that in the acts of the apostles that those who are saved and those who are already delivered at the point of their salvation that every time satan is still troubling them it's all these witches and wizards it's all this synagogue of satan it's all this this and all, all that and then they go back again and they go back again in your life god gives you permanent victory in Jesus name now if all the apostles were like that and the apostles going back for deliverance again the pastors of the New Testament deliverance again when do we have time to do the work of God all that is under our feet Satan is under your feet that synagogue is under your feet all those demons are under your feet in Jesus name they will not bother you anymore. Stand up and do the work of the Lord because there's an open door before you and nobody can shut that door in Jesus' name. The people that are always not seeing, you know, one problem or the other, not seeing one idea or the other, not seeing, you know, they're after me again, they're after me again. I, I thought the door was shut already. How did they come through to open the door and be after you? There's nobody after you. There's nothing after you. You are free, as free as a bird in the air in Jesus' name. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. It is the truth we know about the promise of the Lord, and the promise of the Lord that cannot change. It is that truth that makes us overcomers, and we're overcomers in Jesus' name. 
because thou hast kept the word of my patience, the word of my perseverance, I will also keep thee in that hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world. He's talking about the great tribulation there, the trouble, the tribulation, the, 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 uh, all that uh, temptation, all the trial that will come upon the whole world. The Lord says before that tribulation comes, he'll take us out of the world. He'll come to catch us away. If you are saved and sanctified, if you are holy and pure, if you are righteous and loyal to the Lord, when that trumpet will sound, he'll take us away before the great tribulation in Jesus' name. That tribulation is to come to try them that dwell on the face of the earth. Uh, that, that's the purity of uh, the people of God. I want you to see the uh, First Corinthians chapter 10, chapter 16 rather. First Corinthians chapter 16. It tells us about who we are and what the Lord has done for us. This door that is open that no man can shut, it will be your privilege in Jesus' name. And look at this in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 9. It says, For a great and effectual door is opened unto me. A great and, effect, uh, and uh, an effectual door is opened unto me, and there are many adversaries, many adversaries. These are not demons. It's just talking about persecution because they are false brethren. They were against Paul the Apostle. The Jewish people, they were against Paul the Apostle. The idol worshippers, when he came to town, and he told them to forsake their idols, and those who are making much gain out of that idolatry, they were against him. But in all that, he was an overcomer. In all this, will be an overcomer in Jesus' name. And then he says in verse 10, Now, if Timotheus come unto you, if Timotheus come, see that he may be with you without fear, for he walketh the work of the Lord as also as I also do. In 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, I'm reading from chapter 1 and verse 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 10. It says, Who delivered us from so great a death? He has delivered you already. And does deliver in the present tense. And in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. You'll see the three sentences there in the past. He delivered us. In the present, he does deliver us. In the future, it says he will yet deliver us. And nothing will hinder the great work he has committed into our hands in Jesus' name. It tells us uh, when we talk about the open door in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 12. Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened unto me of the Lord. A door was opened unto me of the Lord. God is opening doors. I said the Lord is opening doors. And after this, a workers retreat, more doors will open in Jesus' name. And as those doors open, it's an opportunity for you and for me to get through those open doors and preach the word of God and bring souls into the kingdom. And you'll do that in Jesus' name. In Colossians chapter 4, Colossians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. Colossians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. Colossians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. In Colossians chapter 4, here is what the Lord is telling us in Colossians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. It says, This is the word of the Lord, where thou praying also for us, that God will open unto us a door of utterance. Once that door opens, then you get there the openness to be able to open your mouth and utter the word of God, communicate the word of God to speak the mystery of Christ. For which I am also in bonds, that I may make it manifest, make it known as I ought to speak. I pray that that open door of opportunity set before you. Nothing will close it or shut it in Jesus' name. The reason God is doing that is so that we'll have the privilege of preaching the word unto other people. Now let's come back to this Revelation chapter 3 and see what the Lord said about this church the kind of strength they had. It tells us, in a, it tells us, I'm reading again from verse 8. I know that works. Behold, I've set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, for thou hast how much strength? 
I said thou hast how much strength tell me out loud how much strength a little strength and has obeyed has kept my word and has not denied my name a little strength a little strength a little strength in Matthew chapter 17 verse 20 Matthew chapter 17 verse 20 a little faith, a little strength, a little grace, a little power it gives unto us. And that little strength, that little faith will accomplish much in our lives. And Jesus said unto them, Matthew chapter 17 verse 20, And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief, that is if there's any failure at all, it's because of our unbelief. If there's any backward, you know, backwardness, it's because of our unbelief. If there's a mountain we cannot remove, we cannot climb, it's because of our unbelief. If we think there's a part of the word of God we find it difficult to obey, it's because of our unbelief. If there's a challenge we're facing and we cannot successfully face that challenge, it's because of our unbelief. It says, because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, if ye have faith, as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove. And it shall remove. And then he says, And nothing shall be impossible unto you. After this time, with that little strength, and little grace, and little unction, and little anointing, and little ability, nothing shall be impossible unto us in Jesus' name. It tells us in John chapter 17, these people that had little strength, it's he he told, he's telling us, they have kept my word with that little strength, that little ability, that little unction. They have kept my word. Look at this in John chapter 17 verse 6. John chapter 17 verse 6. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. And it says, thine they were. And it says, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. They have kept thy word. They were not sanctified yet. They have kept thy word. They have not been filled with the Holy Ghost yet. They have kept thy word. It says, all these people who are saved, who are born again, the grace that comes to us is at salvation. I have a little the faith that comes to us at salvation, however small, the strength that comes to us at salvation, however small it may be, they have kept thy word. You see, there are people, they, they do not know the Bible, and they deceive themselves. They say, the reason I can't obey the word of God yet is that I am not sanctified. I know that I'm living in the wrong home. I know that, you know, to be a second wife there or to marry to, you know, somebody that's, you know, you, is, uh, you're married to somebody who is a second wife over there. He says, I cannot make restitution now because I have a little strength. I'm only born again. When I get sanctified, when I get baptized in the Holy Ghost, then I'll be able to make restitution. Look at this again. They were not sanctified yet. They were just born again. They were children of God. Their names were written in the book of life in heaven. And it says, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thy the one, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. We'll keep the word of God in Jesus' name. Because of the strength we have at salvation, we'll be able to keep what the Lord has given unto us. It tells us in Isaiah chapter 49, verse 23. Isaiah chapter 49. I'm reading from verse 23. It says in verse 23, And the king shall be thy nursing fathers, and the queens thy nursing mothers, they shall bow down to thee with their face toward the earth. Did I hear any amen there? Yeah. And lick up the dust of thy feet, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord, for they shall not be ashamed that wait for me. You will not be ashamed in Jesus' name. Chapter 60 of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 60. I'm reading from verse 14. Isaiah chapter 60 verse 14 The sons also of them that afflicted thee shall come bending down on, unto thee 
and all they that despised thee in the past shall bow themselves down at the soles of thy feet and they shall call thee the, the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. That's the promise the Lord gave to that church, that overcoming church, that triumphant church, that holy church, that righteous church. He said, the synagogue of Satan, all that oppressed them before, they'll come and bow before them. It will happen in our day and to us our, our time in the mighty name of Jesus. The Lord sets an open door before a pure church, before a persevering church. This church that kept Christ's word, they kept Christ's word in all its entirety. They were not picking and choosing. I will obey that, but that I have nothing to do with that. I believe in salvation. I don't believe in sanctification. I believe in sanctification. I don't believe in the Holy Ghost baptism. I believe in Holy Ghost baptism. I don't believe in speaking in tongues. I believe in speaking in tongues. I don't believe in miracles. All that will not be there. It says they believed the word of God. They accepted the word of God in its entirety. And then they had not denied his name in all that that name stood for. And they are, when their adversaries, when their persecutors brought much pressure upon the ministers and the members, they stood because they had strength. We are going to stand because we have strength in Jesus' name. They seem to have a little strength, but little is mighty when God in his seat, just like a little, a little divine faith that we have can move mountains and find nothing impossible. A little divine strength can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And this time you'll find the strength of the Lord abundantly sufficient in your life in Jesus' name faithfulness with the little we have opens a door of more opportunities in ministry for us. When the Lord has given you a little and you're faithful to that, the Lord has given you a little chance, little opportunity, little open door and little strength and you're faithful to that, the Lord will open more doors of opportunity for you and you'll be able to go through. But if you have not done what you are given to do now, there's a little opportunity you are given and then you are not playing your part, you are not playing your role, you are not paying the price, you are not doing what you ought to do with that little opportunity i will more come but more will come in jesus name intense persecution had come on the church from professing religious people making false claims but the church had remained loyal to the cause of christ the lord promised to subdue the enemies of the truth under the faithful people of God in this church of Philadelphia. He was going to prove his love to his consecrated people for all to see. And he will protect and preserve the church in his purity. And he will preserve us in his power. And from the temptation, from the tribulation that is going to come upon the world, he says he's going to preserve the faithful church that is totally yielded and submissive unto him. What he has promised is going to fulfill. When the rapture takes place, the righteous will go with him. The pure will go with him. The faithful will go with him. The steadfast church will go with him. And we will not go through the tribulation in Jesus' name. We are not waiting for the Antichrist. We are waiting for Jesus Christ himself. And he will catch us away before the Antichrist comes to reign in this world in Jesus' name. Point number three now is the concourse position as a pillar and his crown. We're coming to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, and I'm reading from verse 11 all through to verse 13. Revelation chapter 3, and we're reading from verse 11. Revelation chapter 3, we're looking at verse 11. Behold, I come quickly. The Lord is coming again. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Hold that fast which thou hast, and no man, let no man take your crown. Hold that fast, which thou hast. Don't, don't hold your salvation with a loose hand. Don't lose the, don't, don't uh, hold the ministry with a loose hand. Don't lose the opportunities you have with a loose hand. Hold that fast, that no man take thy crown. 
the opportunity you have to serve in the kingdom of God, the opportunity you have to be a worker, to be a minister, to be a shepherd, to be a pastor, hold it fast so that nobody will take your crown. There's some people that are careless with the opportunities there. They say, I don't care. I don't care. You can take, you know, the ministry. I don't care. You can take the pastoral. I don't care. You can take the missionary work. I don't care. You can take whatever it is. And I'm all right. I'm all right. No, you are not all right. If the work is taken away from your hand, there'll be no reward. You can't get any reward for the work you have not done. You will lose your crown. That's why it's saying everything you have, your personal experience with the Lord, hold it fast because that's your ticket to heaven and the opportunities you have to minister. Hold it fast. You don't hold it fast by force. You don't hold it fast by fighting. You hold it fast by your faith, by your loyalty, by your faithfulness and by your submission, by your sacrifice, by your consecration. That's how you hold it fast so that nobody will take your crown and your crown nobody will take from you in Jesus' name. He that overcometh, he that overcometh, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. It's only the people that overcome. You know, there are people that will, that will say, everybody is going to get to heaven. Some even include sinners and backsliders. They say, eventually everything will be all right for everybody. And they say, all the roads will lead to Rome. All roads may lead to Rome. All roads do not lead to heaven. The broad way does not lead to heaven. It's the narrow path of faithfulness and righteousness and holiness that leads to heaven is the narrow path of believing on the Lord Jesus and Jesus alone and he having his power to transform your life is that's the only way that gets to heaven all roads do not lead to heaven all religions do not lead to heaven all characters do not lead to heaven just believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and then he makes a change in your life and when he makes that change you retain that change you hold on to that change that was leads to heaven and so if you're going to be an overcomer you'll be an overcomer by the faith you have in Christ by the by the holding on to the Lord and not letting him go then you get to heaven then he'll make you a pillar in the temple of his God and then he says he shall go no more out and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God which is New Jerusalem which cometh down from heaven and from my God and I will write upon him my new name. Now what a church this is. A church that overcame and what a Christian you are if you follow the pattern of this a church of what the Lord has done for them. Watch an overcomer. To be an overcomer what do you hold on to? What do you have? Number one, sound conversion sound conversion a kind of conversion there's no shadow of doubt about it at all you've been to calvary you've been to christ you've been to the cross and the cross has crossed out every sin in your life and the blood of jesus Christ that is shed on the cross of calvary has cleansed you has purged you and you have sound conversion like paul the apostle everywhere he went he said i was converted i was con i was on the road to damascus and this happened and that happened and i know i'm converted sound conversion number two scriptural conviction to be an overcomer there will be number one sound conversion there will be scriptural conviction there are some people who don't have any conviction at all and if you don't stand for anything you will fall for everything if you don't know which way is right you will fall for anything that comes to you but you must have scriptural conviction if you're going to be an overcomer number three saintly conduct and character saintly conduct and character that's the overcomer the one that you know knows the word of god the requirement of the word of god the demand of the word of god and then he has saintly conduct and character number four is soul winning commitment soul winning commitment the work has committed into our hands you are up and doing you are loyal you are faithful you are dutiful you are fruitful and you're doing that work it is that soul winning commitment that shows that you are preparing you are getting ready is committed that house rush into your hand is committed that choir into your hand is committed that ocean work in your hand is committed all those are children work youth work women's work is committed that into and the campus work he has committed the language work is committed into your hand and whatever it is has committed into your hand you have this soul winning commitment 
commitment, you are adding value, you are adding souls, you are bringing them out of the world, you are bringing them to the kingdom of God. Number one is sound conversion. Number two is scriptural conviction. Number three is saintly conduct and character. Number four is soul winning commitment. Number five is steadfast commitment and steadfast consecration. Steadfast consecration. You lay everything upon the altar. It's not that you say, Lord, I lay my tithe and offering on the altar before, but I have been in. Excuse me, I'm going to take it back again. And then you take it back again. No, there is the consecration, the commitment is steadfast. It's steadfast. You say it is there and giving it to the, my life. You know, you give your life to the Lord and then you say, Lord, this looks like a busy period for me now. I need to take part of my time back. I cannot come to, you know, the leaders meeting on a Tuesday or Wednesday. I cannot come to the workers preparatory something on Saturday. And in fact, I may not be able to come to this Sunday service now because things are busy for me. Excuse me, Lord, for this time. I don't think I can make all that commitment anymore. I gave you that commitment you know, about two years ago when, when things were less busy, but other things are taking priority now. Not at all. There is that steadfast consecration, sacrificial consecration. Number six is supernatural courage. Supernatural courage. All those members of the synagogue of Satan, they'll try and challenge, they'll come to you, they say, are you still there? Are you still deeper? Are you still going deeper in the Lord? They'll say, yes, every day I want to go another step further, another step further, another step further. Further. But if you don't have this supernatural courage, they will intimidate you. They will beat you back. But they will not beat you back in Jesus' name. And then number seven is sustained connection. Sustained connection. You put your, you put your something there in that socket and current is always flowing and current is always there because there is sustained connection. Not that your battery now is dead and you don't have any connection at all. The phone is not working. The fridge is not working. Nothing is working because there's no connection anymore. But sustained connection is there every time. And every time you need to call onto heaven, heaven is standing at attention because there's that sustained connection. And I pray that all these qualities of the overcomer, sound conversion, all these qualities of the overcomer, scriptural conviction, all these qualities the Lord is talking about, saintly conduct and character, all these qualities, uh, the soul winning commitment and steadfast consecration and supernatural courage and sustained connection, it will be ours in Jesus' name. We will not fail. We will not faint. We will not falter. We'll go on until the trumpet sounds and then he calls us home. And when we get home, we'll come with real faithfulness and fruitfulness and we're going to have great rewards in heaven in Jesus' name. Why don't you rise up and tell the Lord, I'll be part of them. I'll be part of them. When the saints go marching in, I will be there. And when God is giving out the rewards, I will not be let out. I will have reward. I will have reward because I'm going to remain an overcomer. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer. I'm going to be an overcomer. I am going to be an overcomer. I'm going to be an overcomer. Whatever it takes, I lay everything on the altar. I lay everything on the altar. Afresh again, once again, I come to give everything unto the Lord. I am going to be an overcomer. Are you born again? Are you soundly converted? Are you a real child of God? And do you have that scriptural conviction? Or are you just a wishy-washy Christian? A wishy-washy Christian. You don't know what you believe. You don't know what to stand for. And you're just, you know, when you are happy, you are committed. When you are not happy, you are not committed. Are you there all the time? All the time. And are you about your father's business? Do you have that scriptural conviction? Do you have the saintly conduct? A saintly conduct? A saintly conduct? Do you have that saintly character? Are you saying, Lord, here am I. Here am I. You can trust me. You can depend upon me. Do you have the soul winning commitment? I'm a winner of souls. I'm a winner of souls. You are going about. You are preaching the gospel to every creature. Do you have the steadfast, uh, the steadfast uh, consecration? Oh Lord, everything on the altar. Everything on the altar. Everything on the altar. I have a supernatural courage that whatever comes, whatever comes, whatever comes, and whoever comes and tries to beat you back, and tries to stop your way and says you are not going to make progress say no, I'm going to make progress supernatural courage and then the sustained connection the sustained connection, is it there? is it there? is it there? 
during this work as you treat, don't let anything be left untouched, unturned, undealt with. Make sure everything is done according to the will, according to the word of the Lord. Let the Lord take absolute control over your life and be an overcome. Plan to be an overcomer. Live to be an overcomer. Consecrate to be an overcomer. It's only the overcomers that the Lord has promised all these things. And he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches.